Welcome to Drink Beer, Think Beer, the podcast that gets to the bottom of every pint. I'm John Hall, and this week is an important conversation about brewery safety and how even with precautions, problems may be lurking. Dave Hadish of Lone Rider Beer in North Carolina is here to talk about his recent experience with malt dust that landed him in the hospital. But first, please go visit allaboutbeer.com. There, you can find original articles, reviews, news, insights, and other podcasts. Listen to shows like Brewer to Brewer and the All About Beer podcast simply by searching All About Beer wherever you listen to shows. You can also follow All About Beer on Instagram, Threads X, and Facebook at All About Beer. And to keep up with all of the smoked beer news and releases, make sure you check out This Week in Rauk Beer by searching the group on Facebook or follow at TW Rauk Beer on X Threads and Instagram. Glassware and apparel is available on allaboutbeer.com slash merch. This show and all of the work we do, it's supported by you. Please go visit patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. A few dollars goes a long way to help fund writers, photographers, creators, and editors. And if you'd like to learn more about advertising and supporting All About Beer, please email us at info at allaboutbeer.com. A few weeks back, Dave Hadish of Lone Rider Beer began posting shots of himself on social media in the hospital after being admitted for breathing problems. It turns out it was exposure to malt dust that landed him there. He's been a part of the North Carolina craft beer industry since 2010, when he got a start at Full Steam Brewery in Durham. In 2016, Dave was brought on to develop and lead brewing operations at Mason Jar Lager Company, and he's now leading brewing operations at Lone Rider Beer in Raleigh and co-brewing with the team at Fortnite Brewing in Cary. He's an active member of the State Brewers Guild and sits on the Education Committee. He walks us through his career and the last several scary weeks. Here's our conversation. Dave, thanks for, for doing the show. Thanks for being here. Um, I want yeah, to hear pleasure. the story in your own words on what happened and how it happened. And so I, I, I don't have like a, you know, a formal kickoff here, but I, I'm, I've been following your posts on social media about all of this, but if, if you can sort of unpack this medical journey that you've been on for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I was, uh, this was, gosh, what, two weeks ago now, um, <clears throat> late June. Uh, I came into work on Monday like normal, uh, you know, doing normal brewer things. And part of that is uh, pulling grain from the silo and uh, milling it for uh, preparation for that week's brews. Um, we brew in uh, 30 barrel batches. Um, so uh, right now we, we have a grain silo outside. Uh, but there's no auger system currently connected to it. So it's a manual process of going out and pulling grain um, out of there, weighing it and getting it to the mill. Um, <clears throat> we had just gotten a, a new malt shipment uh, into that silo. And so as we're pulling it out, we were kind of joking about how much more dusty it, it was than normal. Um, <clears throat> you know, we're so used to it and it's always such an afterthought. Um, at least in my experience with with brewing that, you know, you're not really thinking about the dust or anything like that. You just kind of become used to it. And um, but so something, I was down but something was, that day made you feel like it was yeah a little more. Oomph than yeah, usual. I, yeah, I was out there. We always do it in teams. And um, I was talking to one of the guys who was with me and and I, and I was rem remarking that just felt like a, a lot more dust than normal. And um, I was kind of sneezing off and on, which is not really that uncommon, but um, it was enough for me to kind of take note of it and just be like, this is different. Something's different, but I, I didn't put too much into it. Um, and so we came in, we milled, I, I did all the milling uh, that day. Um, obviously grain dust gets around and, and uh, you know, again, something we're, we're quite used to, but um you know, the sneezing just kept on. And, and that evening, Monday evening, um, I started to feel like I was getting a little bit of a sinus infection. I was getting congested in the nose and the sinuses, um, sneezing, nothing alarming at all. You know, it's the usual, you're around some dust or something that irritates you, your body kind of reacts a little bit. Well, Tuesday uh, came in, basically did the same thing twice that day. Um, and uh, 
<clears throat> that evening, uh, you know, as the day progressed, I was sneezing more and more and more, becoming more and more congested. And I was like, yeah, this is probably just a sinus infection. I was talking to the guys about it. I was like, you know, I think I've got a sinus infection. You know, it's not that big of a deal. Um, and then Wednesday, uh, I was brewing and I just felt awful. I felt like I was getting tired quickly. Uh, breathing was fine. I didn't have any issues really. And then, uh, right around lunchtime, I kind of developed a dry cough and huh. uh, it was, uh, nothing right away, but then it just, it kept increasing. That cough became more and more frequent. Um, and I was like, yeah, I'm, I definitely have something. Um, and so Wednesday night when I got home, um, I, you know, I, I loaded up on a bunch of allergy medicines. Uh, I loaded up on, uh, Mucinex to kind of help alleviate the sinus pressure and stuff like that. Uh, and by about 10 o'clock that night, I had, was coughing pretty significantly. Um, and I was honestly, I was worried that I had COVID. I was like, I, I was going to say, it, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's spiking up again these days. And, right. you know, when you have some of these onsets of symptoms, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like, you know, go take a COVID test. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, all these things, all the normal things, right? Sinus congestion, uh, cough, you know, I was like, it could be allergies. It's summer here in North Carolina. So it's, you know, it's hot as shit and there's pollen everywhere. And, um, you know, so I'm just thinking that this is nothing alarming, you know, I just kind of carrying on. I went to bed uh, about 10 o'clock. I had developed a little bit of a wheeze. Uh, and, and, you know, I was just like, all right, this is just crummy. It's going into my chest or whatever. Well, two o'clock in the morning, I'm startled awake. I, I could not catch my breath. Oh my um, God. and, uh, it, it like, I woke up and it just felt like I had just sprinted a marathon and it didn't matter what I did. Uh, I, you know, I was like, well, maybe if I lay this way or sit up for a little bit or whatever, and as the hours progressed, it just increased more and more and more. The, the breathing became more and more labored. Um, and so I texted my buddy Adam and I was like, man, I think I have bronchitis. I don't know, but I think I have bronchitis because he recently had a bout of bronchitis. And I'm like, tell me what you're experiencing. And I was like, OK, maybe that's it. Um, so <laughs> I, but I, I stayed up all night. There was no way I could sleep because I just was not in a place to sleep. And uh, about seven o'clock that morning, it felt like I was having a panic attack. Uh, the breathing had become that labored. Um, and so about eight, eight in the morning, I texted Adam again and I was like, look, I think I need to go to the doctor. So <clears throat> I called my mom of all people and was like, I need, I need you to come get me and take me to, to urgent care. Something's going on. Yeah. And, um, so fortunately here in Durham, uh, we have Duke university, which is right here, Duke hospital. And, uh, they have offices all over the place here. And so the Duke urgent care was about 10 minutes from my house. So by the time my mom had gotten to me, which was really about 45 minutes, um, I could not walk more than two or three feet without just stopping. Um, wow. I okay. was struggling to breathe. It just was just this very labored inhaling and exhaling, uh, wheezing like crazy. Uh, I was coughing, but nothing was coming up. Um, and I think the best way to describe it, uh, how I've been telling people is it felt like I was breathing through a clogged coffee straw is what it felt like. It just felt that narrow. <laughs> That's a so, really vivid image. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, so sh fortunately, you know, it's, it's not far out of my, my house to, uh, the car. So I, I got down into the car and 10 minute ride over to Duke urgent care. And, uh, I barely made it in the door. Like I was so weak. Uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't speak more than one or two words at a time. Um, very, very labored breathing. And the people at the front desk, they just immediately threw me in a wheelchair and they're like to the back. Um, so everything's kind of a blur at this point. Um, I do remember the, the doctor coming in right away. Um, and her exact words, she looked at me and her eyes got big as saucers. And the only thing she said to me, she goes, what the fuck are you doing here? And, and I just, I mean, I couldn't even answer her. And she was like, you need to go to the ER right now. I'm calling you an ambulance. Wow. Um, okay. 
So they immediately started an IV. Um, they started a breathing treatment on a nebulizer right away. They did mm-hmm. not know what was going on. Um, yeah, but but anything to sort of open up those airways a little bit. Those oh, nebulizers yeah. can do uh, do wonders. Yeah, Ab- absolutely. Um, you know, she was. I was just listening. I, I couldn't even talk, but I'm. I'm. I'm rem- I remember bits and pieces of it where they were like, you know, describing my complexion as like blue to gray. Um, you know, blue pale lips. Uh, you know, all these things, and I'm just sitting there. Just, I felt like I was in a like watching a movie almost. It was like kind of like this weird out of body experience kind of thing. And um, but all but all yeah. of those things that you're describing. I mean, it sounds like you were suffocating. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. And uh, yeah, my airways were were closing. So what they called it uh, in the ER was um, AHRF, which is acute uh, hypo. Um, oh, I'm going to mess it up now. Uh, acute hypoepoxic respiratory failure. Okay, uh, that's what it was. So I was in respiratory failure uh, as I got, you know at whatever point that morning I, I declined into that condition. So they got me to the ER. Uh, I was greeted by a team of, of doctors and uh, they continued to work on me for the next several hours. Um, lots of steroids, lots of breathing treatments, lots of x-rays, CAT scans, trying to figure out what's going on. Um, I was uh, in the ER for the majority of the day. Um, I think I got there sometime mid morning uh, and I was there until late in the evening, but I had started to late in the afternoon show response to the treatment um, and was starting to, you know, be able to to breathe a little bit freer. But they had me on oxygen uh, and, and everything else. And uh, they were considering ICU at that point. Um, but then I was visited by a couple of pulmonary specialists who decided that um, I didn't quite need that that level. I had improved enough that they felt okay not putting me in ICU, but they put me in the uh, the um, neurology oncology floor, so I would have 24 hour nurse care right outside my room. So I had two nurses stationed outside my room wow. at all times for for four days. Um, and uh, so they admitted me to the hospital that night, and um, you know I got breathing treatments every uh, two hours. Uh, they were constantly in and out of my room, checking vitals, checking in on me. Um, I was a fall risk, so I wasn't allowed to get out of bed without somebody in there with me to help me. Um, and, uh, you know, stayed in bed basically for two days and then, uh, was responding or still am responding very well to, uh, to the treatments and, um, coughing up all kinds of good stuff and, uh, breathing became a little bit more freer. So they started reducing oxygen and, recovery was underway. And so, you know, after uh, four days on Sunday, they, uh, they decided I was good enough to go home. Um, and so I'm home now and, uh, recovering well, it's, uh, been a week at home. Um, I still get pretty winded, pretty tired, pretty quickly. Um, but so far so good. And, uh, I feel good. I feel strong. And, uh, yesterday I had, uh, my first pulmonary, uh, follow-up after being dis- discharged from the hospital and, uh, my lung function is back to 100%, which is great, um, but I'm not out of the woods yet. I still have, you know, recovery uh, to go. So um, all of, all things are very encouraging, but it's just crazy to think that something so uh, routine that a brewer does um, could actually take your life, uh, you know, so it's it's been a wild ride. So as you were talking or the doctors are working on you and they're, yeah. they're trying to figure out what's going on. When did the idea of this dust yeah. start to enter into the conversation? What, yeah. Did, yeah. So uh, I don't know what made me do it, the forethought or, or whatever, but I remember leaving before, um, before the urgent care, before my mom got to get me to, to take me to urgent care. Um, it sounds silly being a 46 year old man saying my mom came and got me and took me to the doctor. <laughs> but, um, I had, I had written down a note and, and I remember thinking, okay, this gets worst case scenario. They need to know, uh, what I've taken so far and a brief description of what's happened. Cause I knew I couldn't talk. There was no way I would be able to explain this to somebody. So I jotted a quick note saying, you know, I took, X amount of uh, uh, mucinex. I took X amount of Benadryl, um, you know, 
these allergy meds and whatever. And then I just wrote a description saying, I think this is related to grain dust from work. It's the only thing that, that I can think of that would have caused this. Uh, I don't know other than that what's going on. So that's where we all kind of started because that's, you know, I don't have any history of asthma or anything like that. And uh, nothing like this has ever happened to me before. Um, but something just made me think, you know, this has got to be related to that because there was so much um, dust. And I was, I mean, I remember just being covered in it. So that's where that all kind of came from. And when I handed yeah. that to the doctor in the urgent care, she was like, this is perfect. She was like, what happened? And I was like, there's no way I'm telling you. I was like, I can't tell you. And so I just handed her the note and mm -hmm. she's like, this is great. And so that's kind of what set us down this course. So do you get the impression that they, they treated you different because of that? Like if they knew that they were working on, yeah, as opposed to like an infection versus outside particles, like it was something different. Did, yeah. I, did I don't did know. they express that to you? Yeah. They didn't really express that to me. I think they, uh, they didn't really have a good grasp on it, but I think that information was enough for them to say, okay, we can narrow down uh, our approach to how we, how we combat this. And so um, the, the doctors have mentioned several times uh, something called um, farmer's lung or baker's lung, uh, which is more common in like the grain belt areas and stuff like that, where farmers are dealing with uh, moldy grain and things like that. This, this is a more, that's more of like a chronic issue, I believe for, for those guys is the way I understand it, but, uh, it presents very similar. This was more acute. This was more like a, uh, worst case scenario, extreme asthma attack, uh, to the grain dust. And my body just freaked out and yeah. started shutting down. Um, cause it was just so overwhelmed. Uh, and so my body was just attacking itself. And so I think that they, well, I, the way I get, understand it is they just kind of treated it as uh, something along those lines. And and so I think that's kind of standard as far as, you know, oxygen, nebulizer, uh, heavy steroids, things to get your lungs to calm down. The scary thing was when, uh, when I was starting to kind of recover a little bit in the ER, one of the ICU doctors was talking to me. And uh, before he left uh, my room, he was like, He's like, hey man, he goes, he goes, I'm I'm really glad you're responding to this. He goes, you were you were within minutes of of us intubating you. Um, you were that bad. Um, you know, your blood ox got down to the point where we were considering shutting your lungs down for you and letting a machine breathe for you until you recovered. So that kind of kind of was terrifying. A yeah. Cold bucket of water in the face, you know, it's like, holy shit. So um, you know. Yeah, I know it sounds dramatic, but uh, that was real life, man. So it was uh, kind of scary. So yeah. now I'm uh, now I'm uh, doing everything I can to to stay away from that. <laughs> so obviously, I mean, safety in the brew house is something that's been talked about for for a long time, and you know, sure. like I I know you're a you're you're a pro, and you 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 think about a lot of these things. Um, what have you started to um, uh? what have you started to think about doing different going forward? Yeah. Good, good, uh, good question. Um, I mean, obviously first things first, uh, you know, PPE is, uh, is, is really important in the brewery. Um, and if people don't take it seriously, I, I hope they, they start to, um, there's a lot of ways you can get seriously hurt or even, uh, you know, be, be killed in, in a brewery where around, dangerous things all the time, chemicals, pressure, confined spaces, CO2, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, uh, common sense is, uh, is a really great thing uh, that, that humans have. And so what I've been doing is, uh, you know, obviously uh, COVID kind of trained us well to wear masks, uh, some of us at least. And uh, so I wear a, a cloth mask uh, is, is what I'll be doing going forward. Um, I spent a lot of time talking to my doctors in the hospital about ways to, um, you know, mitigate these risks. And so obviously, uh, 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 N95 mask is, is, is a good place to start. I would say that's probably your lowest level of protection. Uh, anything less than that is not going to be good enough. Um, they suggested wearing, uh, a neck gaiter, especially for us, uh, beautifully bearded brewers, 
you know, we're not going to get a good seal around our face uh, to yeah. keep all of the green dust out. So, uh, you know, they suggested maybe taking like a net gator or, a, a, you know, a, a bandana or something and, and using that to help seal the rest of the places around your face. Um, I, uh, I don't know why I do this. Like sometimes I'll just reach out to, to companies when I want to learn about something. And so I've reached out to 3M uh, and I'm still waiting to hear back from them. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've looked up a bunch of their respirators and things that I've used in the past at other breweries. And, and, uh, and so they, they make some fine particulate filters. Uh, I believe it's 2091 or 2097 uh, are the respirator filters. You know, the respirator is like 30 bucks and you buy, you know, multi-packs of the filters mm-hmm. that you can change out as you need. So those those actually work really good for for reducing the the fine particulate of the grain dust and also vapors. So stuff from like chemicals and things like that that would be a lung irritant and things like that as well. Um, and you know, that's obviously probably the best case scenario. But then, um, you know, things like, you know, if your brewery uh, doesn't have a, a, a dust collector um, attached to your mill, uh, you should. Um, it's going to, you know, the cost of, of something like that, uh, you know, it's not nothing to, you know, take lightly, but, uh, it's, it's worth your, your employees and, and their safety. Uh, cause if you don't have them, you don't have anything. So, um, you know, grain, grain, uh, grain dust collectors and, uh, and things like that. So that's kind of what I'm doing now. Um, obviously I'm going to be on light duty coming back into the brewery. So, yeah. um, I'm going to be avoiding exposure for uh, several more weeks to grain dust um, and, uh, you know, slowly working my way back into my normal routine of, of brewing and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I just kind of, kind of doing everything I can to mitigate the dust um, and stay away from it for now. But yeah, definitely PPE. So face masks and, and that good stuff. So, I mean, you, you kind of answered this already, but for brewers out there listening, Mm-hmm. what's the what's the takeaway you want them to have out of this yeah don't become complacent um i know I'm, I'm guilty of that after 15 years um it's something you know that i've been reminded of just in the these last two weeks of of you know other brewers from around the country that i know that have been following along reaching out to me going man this is something i've never thought of and these are experienced brewers that you know have been around for longer than i have um that are like i would have never thought that i would have never thought something like that could have happened and i never thought twice about wearing a mask or or anything and every brewery is different right i mean some people are are way more equipped uh than others and then you have guys who are are don't have anything um and so you know I, i would say just don't become complacent take take it seriously. It's a, it's a minor inconvenience, especially in the summertime where you're like, Oh, I've got to mask up. I've got to, you know, put gloves on. I got to put eye pro on ear pro in, um, you know, things like that for the, the, you know, however long it takes you to mill. I mean, it takes us about 45 minutes to mill, you know, wearing that mask is, is, you know, <laughs> for that 45 minutes and suffering being hot and sweating a little bit more is, is way better than spending four days in the hospital and almost losing your life. I was going to say, um, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's such a minor inconvenience to do that. When you, when you look at it from my perspective now, um, you know, just, just be smart about it, you know, provide the, the PPE for your staff, you know, masks are cheap. Respirators are cheap. Uh, your, your staff is, is invaluable. You know, they're, they're, they're priceless. Um, so you got to keep them safe. You got to, you got to set them up for success with that kind of stuff. So, you know, invest in the proper equipment, invest in the things you need. Um, it's going to save you and everybody else a lot more uh, time and trouble um, on the front end rather than dealing with something like this now. Yeah. Oh, goodness. I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're on the mend through all of this. Yeah, that's, me too. Uh, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's incredibly scary. Um, yeah. as, as you've been recuperating and, you know, you're saying yep. you're going back to light duty, um, which is, you know, which, which will be great. Um, ha- ha- have you been using the time to think about your brewing career in other ways? Yeah. You know, I, I know it's such a breakneck industry, 
right? And yeah. there's schedules and there's time. And I, I, I know a couple of years ago, a lot of folks had um, you know, forced time off because of COVID, but there's other worries about all of this. You know, as you've been slowing down for the last two, three weeks, um, where's where's your mind been taking you as a brewer? Yeah, great question. That has definitely been on my mind. Um, I'm always I'm always thinking. I'm always exploring. Um, I'm big into continuous improvement in all aspects of life, <clears throat> but especially you know with this happening in the brewery, um, you know, how, like you said, how how do I go forward? What does this look like? Uh, my passion is is definitely brewing. I love it. Um, I enjoy everything about it. Um, and you know, now is, this is more like a, uh, another tool and tool belt, tool belt kind of thing. Um, how can I, uh, move this into a more of a advocacy, uh, uh, role where I can, uh, share this story, uh, with other brewers, uh, throughout the state, throughout the country. Um, you know, can I, can I turn this into a presentation that I can give, uh, to breweries, to educate them, to, um, you know, can I partner up with, uh, you know, malt companies and companies like 3M or, or whoever would provide, uh, you know, PPE um, and, and, you know, collaborate with those guys on, on how to do something for the brewing industry. You know, a lot of the guys in the hospital were talking to me about, um, you know, like regulations and things like that. And, and, you know, having been in this industry for as long as, as I have, it's, it still very much feels like the wild, wild West when it comes to a lot of that stuff. And uh, there's no like super solid resources that I've really been able to find to say, Hey, this, this really horrible, awful thing can happen. Uh, and here's how to get away from it. You know, there's no, there's not really anything that I've really found. And so uh, I'm kind of taking it upon myself to, to kind of carry that torch a little bit. Um, and and just find resources to be able to collaborate with and platforms to get that out uh, to other people. Um, I want to I want to add that into like my my portfolio to kind of be able to say, hey, you know, sure, I can help you develop recipes, do cool things like that, have fun in your brewery, uh, plan cool events and things like that. But um, you know, this is a this is very brewer specific and and um, again, having talked to several brewers throughout the country just in this last week, uh, you know, who are just like, I'm buying masks for my team for the very first time. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's eye opening to, to hear that, to say, okay, this is, this is a much more pervasive issue uh, that needs to be addressed uh, sooner rather than later. So, um, so yeah, so I'm kind of playing with some ideas like that. Um, I'm very active with the North Carolina craft brewers guild. So um, I'm actually speaking uh, at a technical brewing uh, conference next week uh, for the guild. And this was not on my radar to talk about. I was going to talk about other dangerous things in the brewery. Um, and, uh, now this is at the forefront of my conversation. So, um, you know, using that, um, I'll be partnering with the guild in some form. Uh, I'm also on the education committee for the guild. So this kind of plays right into that. Um, so being able to use that platform as well to, to spread this, especially within North Carolina, uh, to other breweries, um, where it takes me in my career going forward here, I don't know. Um, I'm I'm happy doing what I'm doing right now. Um, you know, everybody still kind of has that dream in the back of your head of, of doing your own thing someday. But <laughs> the industry is not in a place to to do that right now. And I, I was I was going to say this is this is maybe not the moment, but uh, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> you know, you just yeah. you escape death once, maybe don't. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's not do it again. Um, so, you know, I, I think I'm very fortunate to be in the position that I'm in now, uh, and having the, the connections and the relationships that I do throughout this industry as a whole, uh, is going to, is going to be a launching pad, uh, of some point to this. Um, my friend Adam and I have always joked about me doing a, starting my own podcast or something like that to where it's, uh, more relatable to Don't brewers do it. and Don't do it. I know, right. <laughs> it's like, I need to talk to John about this too. Um, <laughs> all right. But you know, just you want to make love- even less money. Uh, right, podcasting's yeah. <laughs> where it's at. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know, just just a way to connect more with more brewers and 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 share those kinds of things. That's my passion has always been uh, kind of people focused. As as much as brewers like to be introverted, I love talking to other brewers, and you know, you just kind of relates to them a little bit more. So, 
Yeah, that's kind of kind of the idea. Gotcha. Well, you know, I think this is also a great opportunity. You know, you're going to be talking about safety stuff as well, but just any brewers who are listening, you know, take that half day, take that hour, take 20 minutes um, to look around and say, okay, what are we doing that yeah. can be improved safety wise? Um, yeah. And then go do it. You know, it's, yeah. uh, you know, tomorrow's never guaranteed. And right. Uh, I mean, the, the, I'm just sort of struck with the idea that this wasn't an immediate thing for you that yeah. it did take a couple of days of this you know slow burn to come on and with with, with near catastrophic event, you know you know people think of you know, getting burned or a boil over or you know any number of of, of things that have this immediate uh, yeah. consequence to them but yeah it's I, I hope folks hear this and use this as an opportunity to just do a a, a safety check in and update as necessary yeah, I, I would highly encourage that. And you're right. The, uh, you know, the progression of this thing was so uncommon, um, you know, just thinking it was nothing to it quickly uh, devolving into this, you know, life threatening situation uh, where you're in, you end up in respiratory failure from, you know, from doing your job. And, you know, I, I, it scares me to think back because I remember that morning that I, before I left for the urgent care, I was like, I'm just going to tough this out. You know, I'm, I'm stubborn. I'm, I have uh, Scandinavian blood in me. So, you know, I tend to be a little bit more stubborn than most. And, um, and uh, you know, I was just going to tough it out being like, you know, I got this, I can, I can deal with it. And uh, I shudder to think that if I would have waited probably even more than an hour longer, uh, you know, we might not be having this conversation today because that's how fast uh, it really started to go downhill when it really started to go. So, yeah, look around, find the, the things to do. The cost is shouldn't even be an issue. You know, you really shouldn't even think of the cost as an issue and do what you can, invest the money uh, and keep your staff and yourself safe. Well said. Dave, thanks for thanks for being on the show. Thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for sharing your insights. And and I'm, I'm glad to hear you, you, you breathing and talking and <laughs> on the on the right side of the daisies at the moment so um that's right thank for, you john i appreciate yeah. it this conversation is a good reminder to everyone to make sure that you're being safe at all times next week it's back to business as usual and i hope you'll tune in questions comments guest suggestions you can do all of that by emailing me it's john hall that's j-o-h-n-h-o-l-l at allaboutbeer.com a reminder, please go visit allaboutbeer.com. There you can check out the podcast page, the merch page, and read great new content, as well as the archives going back to 1979. You can also follow All About Beer on social media, at All About Beer. And if you're interested in supporting journalism in the beer space, email us at info at allaboutbeer.com or go to patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. Don't forget, All About Beer has a podcast channel. Search and subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. Steal the Spear has new episodes every Monday, and the BYO Nano podcast comes out on the 15th of every month. And don't forget to check out probrewer.com each week for original articles from the All About Beer team. As for this show, Nate Weber does the music, Jeff Quinn designed our logo, and I'm John Hall. New episodes release every Wednesday, and that's when I'll be back again to drink beer and to think beer. <laughs>